people just try to say, this isn't going to happen. And then one day the barricades are up, the phones are cut, the TVs don't work, and, and it's war. Welcome to News Beast. We have Janine in the house. And Luis, we've got a great new story in the new issue of Newsweek. Champagne flows while Syria burns. Welcome to News Beast. It's a really, it's a phenomenal piece. Uh, tell folks at home a little bit about what it was like reporting it out. Well, I wanted to see what Syria was like from the other side, from the government side, um, because there's been a lot of reporting by very brave reporters, um, reporting from the Free Syrian Army side, the opposition. But I wanted to see what it was actually like in the capital and how people were living under this threat of war as war was creeping closer. Um, and it, like in many places where I've reported, you find that people have a great sense of denial, but also fear. People are afraid. I think that's mainly it. There's a sense that their country is about to explode. There's very little that could be done to prevent it. Um, and while it is happening, at the same time, people do have to live their lives. And, and, and there's a sense of what they might lose, too, that this is a highly civilized country at the highest levels, on the elite aristocratic level. And, and they, they fear what might come next. For some people, some people are very poor. Um, in Damascus, and, and the people that I was specifically interviewing, are, are some of them are the elite. They're pro-Assad. Mm -hmm. um, mainly they're pro-Assad because they're afraid of what might come next, right. um, which is a kind of propaganda tool that's being used, but on the other hand, it's also um, a reality. What people don't know often frightens them, so they're, they're happier to stay with what they have. Sure, even when that something is a dictatorship slaughtering its own people. Uh, Luis, tell us a little bit about the process of, of assigning this story. You know, you've got this ongoing crisis, 10,000 people killed. This is not the most obvious angle, and yet it's very rewarding. Well, I mean, as Janina said, it, I think we were very conscious that we wanted the other side. We wanted what, the, what it feels like in Damascus, what the elite sort of our experience and how they're sort of justifying their support for Assad still and despite all these things that we hear and as Janino also pointed out you know we've had a lot of reports by very brave reporters and, and writers and photographers from the rebel side and we really wanted something from the other side from Damascus from within Damascus and you know um, for Janine to go it was really fantastic she could get mm. access to Damascus and and go with the photographer Kate Brooks and really spend time and talk to a lot of people. And I think that was key too. Like, there were so many amazing sort of um, anecdotes in this piece, you know, really showing a wide range of people and how they live. And I thought that's really the strength of the piece. It's like, it's a real sort of um, image, a picture of what's going on. And, and I mean, you know, you've got people at the Philharmonic, wedding, pe uh, wedding dinners where everyone's dressed up. You've got this pool party that looked like it could be taken out of Daytona. Mm. I mean, it, it's sort of frighteningly relatable. Um, one thing you did very well, which is, I think, the most important thing, is, is humanizing people even as, as the context judges them. Uh, well, well, I think on, on one hand also you can't prejudge. This isn't right. the entire society. You know, this, sure. is, this is one very select elite level. And as, as Louisa says, I, I did interview dozens of people. Um, I think that people, um, you know, this layer of society are trying to cling on to something. And I think that's what people naturally do in times of, of war or approaching wars. They try to cling to their old lives. Um, I do, I mean, whenever I write, I think that it's, it draws a reader in much more to focus mm. on the microcosm. And in that way, you can tell the story of the, of the politics behind it, of what is happening behind it. Um, and I think people's individual stories are always much more sure. fascinating and, and give you the real context of, of what's happening on the ground. W w was there a sense that some of these folks that as the body toll climbed and as international pressure grew that they were palpably on the wrong side of history? I don't think they realize it yet. I mean, again, you have to understand that we're on the outside reading mm. this. They're on the inside. Um, they, they're not quite sure what is going to happen. All they know is they feel like the, war, uh, the world is basically against Syria, the entire world except Russia and China. Um, and they're not quite sure why yet. And also, a lot of people, even highly intelligent ones, um, try to block it out and say it's not happening. And this happened in Sarajevo. Um, sure. People just try to say this isn't going to happen. And then one day the barricades are up, the phones are cut, the TVs don't work, and, and it's war. Final word. Um, oh, I don't know. Fear? Chaos. Denial. Um, it's a great story. Congratulations.